Yeah. You're listening to Fresh Out of the Game. And I'd be so fresh. Fresh, fresh Podcast Network. <laughs> Straight from Tel Aviv, Israel. Let's go. Hi, my name is Hilal Leizorovich. And I'm Rana Vaughn. We are two entrepreneurs from Israel. And we are on a journey to find out what makes entrepreneurs, investors, and CEOs succeed or fail. And we hope to inspire your journey. So hello everybody and welcome to another episode on TLV DNA and with us today is Gal Kitter, the managing partner at IBEX. How are you? I'm great, I'm great. Good, uh, good morning everyone, it's great to be here. Thank you for coming in with us as always. Hila Lezorovic. <laughs> All right, Gal, let's start in a nutshell or in a brief. Tell us about IBEX, what you do, your investment strategy. Right, let's start from there. Great, great. So, we're, so at IBEX Investors, we're a U.S.-based investment firm uh, investing in multiple strategies around the world with, with our main one investing in, in, uh, in Israel in both public and private companies that have a significant technological advantage in their market and thus an ability to, to become really huge companies in the future. So in, on the venture side of things, we'll either go early or... in seed series A or a little bit later at around series B, series C, and we'll really try to partner with our companies, help them with whatever they need help on, on their path to becoming a, a hopefully very large company. So it's not only about funds, it's about you opening doors, giving good consultants, contribute to the venture on its journey. Co- completely, completely. So t- to us, once we decide to invest in a company, we really look at it as a partnership and And the partnership from our end is predominantly on, on, on one word, and that's growth. So what that entails is, is really whatever the company needs. But what we're focused on most of all is once we give a term sheet, we'll try um, saying, hey, you know, through the research of our company, of your company, we think there's two or three things that you could really do better or there are opportunities for you to do even more of that we feel comfortable helping you. Right? And those are predominantly on issues of growth. So it could be a new channel. It could be changing the pricing. It could be uh, changing the mix of marketing or growing more inbound marketing, right? So a variety of topics. And we'll try to go in and kind of roll up our sleeves and help the company on those topics. Okay, so first of all, it sounds great, but it also get a question, okay, someone is getting involved now. I'm, he's, get, he's getting his money and now he's becoming a part of the decision makers. How do you feel under the entrepreneurs feels? Yeah, no, so that's a great question. So that's a great question. Um, and, and I think there is, uh, I, I saw a, a survey of entrepreneurs and this was in Israel and they asked them, you know, hey, what's the number one thing aside from money that you want from your VC? And the number one answer, unsurprisingly, was connections, yeah. right? Business connections Network, and connections yeah. to clients yeah. and investors. And, and, you know, we do that. And then the second thing was nothing, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, so this Funds was... Funds and connections. Yeah. So, so uh, you know, nothing as just leave me alone, right? So first, this is not a fit for everyone. There are some entrepreneurs that say, hey, all I'm looking for is capital. And in most cases, those are not the right uh, companies for us to invest in. Um, but you know, that being said, you know, I, feel, I really feel for the entrepreneurs because if, you, if, if you're you know, thinking of yourselves as a big part of helping the business grow, you, you can't come in at a board meeting and give an interesting piece of advice and you need to go, in, you, you need to go deep. Right? So what we do is, as part of this model, we'll focus on a few areas and we'll try to go really, really deep. And sometimes we have expertise, sometimes we don't, and we think through who is literally the number one, number two, number three expert in the world on this topic, and we'll try bringing them in with us. And, and we'll just, I think more importantly than that, we'll spend the time. And from what we've seen so far, um, that, that model works. And that model brings a lot of value to companies that I think sometimes they're not used to getting from a partner that 
provides them with, with capital, first and foremost. I like that approach. I like that policy. And I understand you say it doesn't always match, you know, like entrepreneurs are looking just for capital, know what they do. It's not their first time even, so it's not always a match. But tell me, you're a based, uh, a U.S.-based uh, venture capital. What are you doing here? So, so it's, a, it's, it's a good question, right? So Ibex was founded around eight years ago. And, you know, this was, this was literally after our, our partners in the U.S., they, uh, they read the book Startup Nation Central. They, they read a book, you know, the, the, the Startup Nation. And they started coming to Israel more and more. They started getting to know the ecosystem. And, and our thesis was essentially that, you know, we don't invest only in Israel. We do make, make investments in other spaces. We have a mobility fund. We're very focused on that space. We'll opportunistically invest in the U.S. as well. But in general, uh, we believe that the, 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 some of the biggest technological innovations are going to come out of Israel. Um, and the country has the, the, the best breeding ground for new technologies and new, new innovations. So, at, you know, really from the start, IBEX began with a very strong focus on Israel because of that. Try to describe what's unique about the Israeli ecosystem that, like you said, give more opportunity to technologies to throw. Yeah, so, so it's, it's, a, it's a good question. You know, one, one that I've been thinking a lot uh, about a lot, and, 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 you know, many have given their answers to it. I, 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 think the, I think the number one element is if you think about cultures in general, some cultures are rule-following and some cultures are rule-breaking, right? It's yeah. not a good thing or a bad thing. Uh, we are, for good and bad, we're a rule-breaking culture, right? Whenever we have a rule or, regu or regulation, we'll try to think, well, how do you do it differently? How can you do it better? How can you not do it exactly as it's been or said? Or a shortcut. Or a shortcut, <laughs> right, exactly. Ass, back door. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, you know, it's not great for following COVID rules, right? Mm -hmm. But it's actually really good for innovating industries because we always, we have that mindset. I think that's one. A second thing, you know, so I spent a good amount of my career in, in the U.S. and, and I, did a, uh, I did an MBA. And, you know, as part of that, a lot of the MBA uh, graduates were thinking, you know, where do I go? What do I do? Israel, because it's such a small market, um, there aren't um, a ton of attractive employment opportunities in industry, right? So our banks are not the biggest banks in the world. True. Our telecom companies are not the biggest, you know, yeah. companies in the world. Our CPGs are not, right? So if, if someone in Israel wants to really think big, they really need to think about innovation, you know, for the most part. And, and then there isn't a lot of that competition for the top talent from, from the banks and the telcos and, you know, the CPGs, whereas in other markets, you know, sometimes... You know, you can have a huge company and with really attractive growth, and then a lot of people will go there. So I think it's, it's we have the mindset of entrepreneurship, and it's really not competing with a ton of attractive, you know, opportunities on the business side for the, you know, for the really top tier talent in the country. And the fact that Israel is small, sometimes it's like a focus group before you go out. Like a compact place to create your MVP or your market fit. Exactly. Yeah, it, it, it is. And, and, and some, some companies in Israel, some startups, they will do that. And then some startups, they'll even say, hey, you know, it, it's, it's even irrelevant. I'll, leave, I'll, I'll entirely skip the Israeli market just because the characteristics are so different than the U.S. market that they'll, they'll often strive to get to as their, uh, as their main avenue of growth. Yeah. So like the big giant tech companies that actually create their... Uh, uh, R&D centers here in Israel, um, just be near that place where innovate, you know, being created every day. So you, you decided to create another base here in Israel and be closer to the innovation ecosystem. We, we, we did. We did. So, so first, we're, we're really a global fund. So we have offices in Denver. We have offices in New York City. And we have another office uh, here in Tel Aviv, obviously. Um, and, and the fund, even before the establishment of the office here, um, was, was very, very active. Um, and they were just, you know, doing it remotely. They would, they would, you know, my partners in the U.S., they'd fly over, they'd come, you know, sometimes six, seven, eight, nine times a year, uh, and they did a lot of work remotely. So they were really plugged into the ecosystem even before. Um, I think, 
you know, having boots on the ground here is, is really helpful, you know, even, and, and we, we chatted about this briefly before the podcast started, um, even during COVID, it's helpful. Uh, because so, you get to visit the companies and so forth. But that was my next question, because, <laughs> okay, you said flying, and then, okay, so now it's on Zoom. <laughs> What do you do with COVID? Yeah. How do we deal with it? Yeah, right. So, I mean, our, our entire ecosystem has, uh, has adjusted to this um, with, uh, with essentially almost no flights in this period. Um, but, you know, first, uh, we are making investments and other funds are making investments even without meeting anyone face-to-face. Um, so in our early stage fund, most of the investments we've made recently have been without, without meeting the company in person, right? And we've, we've met them later, right? Because of uh, the restrictions. Um, and other colleagues in our industry, that's happening. So that's an adjustment. And then second, working with the companies, I think we're all now very accustomed to doing that remotely. We try finding opportunities to do it in person, but... But it's, it's almost become something that we're used to. It's not even a question on, you know, hey, have you, have you met these guys in person? Because we, we've started getting used to doing it remotely. All right. Okay. Now, we've been flying uh, very high now. Let's uh, open a parachute and touch the ground. Entrepreneurs all over the world, you know, starting point, middle right. point, you know, right. whatever stage they're at. You know, it's always about... You know, at the end of a, of a phase, getting to the, to, the, to the fund, to the right fund or the venture capital, the VC, getting an investment, you know, their oxygen for next round and, right. and creating more growth and more growth. How does that start? You know, a lot of entrepreneurs all over the world, they say, how do I approach this? How do I get a connection? Where do I go? Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's a great question. I think the first decision that an entrepreneur needs to make is if they want their company to be venture-backed or not. Uh, because then you're, w- once you're going and you're taking money from VCs, you're starting to play a different game. And, and th- that game becomes all around growth, right? It, it becomes less about building a, uh, a profitable business in the short term, right? You know, you want to be profitable in the long term. But it becomes about taking capital, improving the business, and growing and growing and growing. And that may be a long journey. And some entrepreneurs may say, hey, you know, I'm not sure that's the journey I want to be on. Right? So first, I would really advise folks to think about taking external capital into the business and the rules of that, of that game. Once you've made the decision that that's what you want, you really are looking to create a, a huge transformative company and, and you need capital from the outside to do that, then um, I think people are, are sometimes a little bit too focused on, on the need and their idea and sometimes even the technology in Israel and, and a little bit less focused on the, on the execution, on the how. And, and I think the way to think about it is You know, your idea needs to be good enough. You know, there needs to be a core need. It needs to be addressable to a very large portion of an industry or a market. Um, and, but, but, you know, I'll say provocatively, there's a lot of good ideas, right? You, you don't build a good business because you have a great idea. Uh, you, 80% of your success will be how you execute. And that's really, really what matters, right? So I think... The more you start thinking about what is the t- how do you create a, a really all-star team at, at the beginning? And second is how do you take this idea and how do you start seeing if it works, testing it, and then thinking about how do you scale it? How do you acquire customers? How do you engage those customers to make a sale? What's the model you want to work with? How much is that going to cost you? How do you try it out and experiment that? So... I'd, I'd start thinking about those topics and really experiment with them as soon as possible. Um, and, you know, maybe focus a little bit less on, um, you know, hey, I have the best idea. Is this the best idea or the second best idea? All right. So let's start phase phase. Okay. Um, it's, really, it's really something that me and Ila are, you know, researching lately. And... You start it and you say yeah, the basic stuff is you need to have a good idea. Uh, let's call it an idea market fit even, okay? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. That you know that you could actually go and say, I checked it. There's market out there that is waiting for that need or it has a big pain and I can solve it. Right. But then you, you, you went right away into the team. How do you rate a team? What does that mean, uh, a strength of the team? 
Yeah, yeah. So, so I, I think especially when you're early, right? And, and you know, as, as investors, the earlier the company is, the more we care about the team itself and the individuals because, you know, hey, you know, we know this company is going to encounter obstacles and is going to have to do what's called a pivot, which is just a small change in the business model or sometimes even in the, in the addressable market. Um, so if you have the right folks, that's 80% of what matters. And, and when you think about, you know, well, what does that mean, having the right team? So, so first, what we'll look at is, are, 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 are these the right set of, uh, is this the right group of people to solve this specific problem, right? So is there a fit between the problem and the people solving it, right? You may be a great entrepreneur for some- yeah, That's for, interesting. For one type of, of problem and, 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 and not a great one for something else. Um, and when you think about that question, that's really um, sometimes there's someone who's, who's encountered a specific, uh, uh, a specific need um, again and again in their life, and, and, they, and they kind of know that challenge more than anyone else. It could be in their industry, in their personal life, right? So that could be one thing. It could be someone that has been in an industry for a long time and understands the pain point, what it does well, what it doesn't do well, right? It could be from the technological side, someone who's figured out a way to use a specific type of technology in a different way, and they're now, you know, becoming smarter and smarter on how to monetize that, right? So it could be from, you know, different angles, but, but it needs to be very personal and it, and it needs to be something that, you know, you, you, know you, you, re, you can really see that person as the innovator for that specific space. So I think w once you get that right, it's who do you surround yourself and what's the complementarity between the team? And that's, that's on a professional level, right? So if you're a really strong technologist, um, you're, you're probably going to need people next to you on, on the brand building side, on the sales side, right? On, on the execution of the go-to-market. And, and it's also on the personal side, right? Um, are, the, are, there, are their own incentives aligned in terms of how they work together? Uh, are their personalities relatively aligned? You know, this is, you know, we joke that the... The, the, the commitment between entrepreneurs and between kind of founders of a business, it, you should think about it as a marriage, hmm. and, and it's even longer than the average marriage, right? So if this is someone that, <laughs> you know, I love you that insight. <laughs> yeah. I mean, you know, the, the average time, I, I think like the average marriage is, uh, you know, hopefully for all of us is going to be uh, infinite, but, but um, the average marriage is, is shorter than the, uh, the average time it takes a company to go, uh, to get acquired or go public, right? So if this is not someone you could spend 16 hours a day with, um, that's a problem. Um, and so I'd really, really think about, about that team aspect as, as really one of the core pillars when building a company. I think the next question, if we're talking about people, I think a lot of entrepreneurs ask themselves, correct me if I'm wrong, Ila, um, when do I establish an advisory board? Mm -hmm. When do I really need it? I know in the U.S. it's something conventional. It really needs yeah. to be established right away from the beginning. In Israel, it's a bit less right. uh, on the focus. But yeah, our range of audiences from all around the world. Let, let's try to, to create a certain standard uh, according to, you know, reasonable facts. Okay. Right. Right. So, you know, I really believe in advisory boards and, and, you know, we also as a fund, we really believe in advisory boards. Uh, we have our own advisory board of senior folks from the industry that help us and that will sometimes we will bring to engage with our companies um, because sometimes you just get perspectives that you would never get working on your own. So we really believe in that in that premise. I think your question on when's the right time is. Um, very, very hard to say because it's dependent between companies. But, but I would say is when you believe that there is a either a perspective or a um, call it a, a skill or a connection that it's very difficult for you to get on your own, right? So if, if you're, for example, if you're a type of company that, that, that'll say, hey, by the time I'm at Series A, my goal is to fully develop my product, test it out on a few customers, have a few pay, have a few paying proof of concepts. I'm um, heads down. That's what I'm focused on. You don't, you actually don't need an advisory board because you're you're in execution mode. But if you say, hey, you know, I either want to think through something very big, or I, I need help 
on you know connection or on um, solidifying something that I'm working on that I'm not really sure of, then then I I do it and and I'd err on doing it earlier versus later, um, so that the that advice can come relatively early in the process. All right, um, around you know numbers of funds, where does it start? Where does your investment starts? In matters of numbers, you mm-hmm. know, are you investing uh, 100K or mm-hmm. it starts from a million or, you know, from there and up um, and, and try to parallel it to stages? Yeah, great. So, so we have, we're investing out of two funds. Um, one fund, uh, which is the fund that, that I co-lead with another one of my uh, partners in, in the U.S., um, will we'll write checks between uh, six, seven, all the way up to $20, $25 million per company. Um, and we'll, we'll almost always look to lead a funding round. Um, and, and what that entails in terms of stages, it's, it's usually, our sweet spot is at around the B stage. Um, it could be at a C round. It could also be at a large A. Um, it could also be another round, right? But in terms of those amounts, the best fit is likely around a B, right? In, in the market and, you know, those definitions are fluid, right? They always change in terms of how much is raised in a round uh, per the environment. Yeah. Then we have another fund um, that invests earlier and will write checks of between two and four million dollars. Uh, also will look to lead around. Um, and there we'll do that in, in a seed or in even in an early A, uh, in, a in a smaller A. Um, and we'll, uh, so obviously there will be involved a lot, a lot earlier. So... Yeah, as, a, as a VC, you have many requests and you need to sort the request mm-hmm. and to create like a, d- a create good deal flow and clean all the noise. So tell us the criteria and the process so entrepreneurs will know when to approach and how you check them. Right, right, right. So I think we're, we're um, you know, we're lucky in the Israeli environment that, that um, everyone knows each other. That's, that's how it feels. Um, So um, it's, you know, we, we can almost always get to anyone and have a personal conversation within the day in another fund, in another, you know, company. So um, d- deal flow, I think, in the Israeli market is, is a little bit easier because we, you know, we, we chat with all the funds um, that invest earlier than us and hear about their companies, how they're doing. Uh, we, we know a bunch of entrepreneurs. We have a pretty big network. Um, and so we, we get the inflow coming in. That brings uh, you more confidence. So, so it, it, it brings us more confidence that we know of the companies. Uh, but there comes the challenge of, you know, you know, a lot of the companies now the initial stage of assessment on deciding who do you, who you would like to engage with further, uh, becomes challenging, right? Because there, there's a lot of companies, there's a lot of great companies, Um, and, and unfortunately, we, we can only invest in, in around 1%, 2% of the companies that, that we'll meet. So uh, that, that initial assessment is really core. Let's try to understand numbers and la- um, versus percentage. Yeah. How many one-pagers as IBAX or your department or branch gets a year? So, um, you know, we'll look at around... Um, around 500 550 600 companies something like that and you know some will be a one pager some will you know engage with them and see the whole deck some will read a little bit about um, and uh, you know at the end of the day it's, we don't have a set number of companies that will invest and it's not like we say hey you know we'll invest in sit in six because if you have that strategy you end up you Either missing great opportunities or investing in a company just to hit that number right but on, on average it, it'll come out that we'll invest in around between one and you know two percent of the companies the companies that we'll meet try to take it to your personal point of view what will catch your eye when you think so many yeah one yeah so so I think um, so there, there's there's a, there's a few po- there, there's a few points that are important to Uh, to us um, one is and this is you know this is a little bit of a different answer on the later stage and on the early stage I'm more focused on the later stage I'll give you the answer on the later and then it's it's a different answer on the early right um, on the later stage um, what, what I what I love seeing is a company that understands the game that it's playing 
right? So the, the, the way we think about it is there's, there's, there's a few different games that you can play in. And, um, and different games fit different companies, different industries. So we'll look at the metrics and we'll look at um, the, the company's strategy in terms of, you know, I don't want to get too technical, but it's, you know, the percentage of leads that come from outbound and inbound, the, the cost of an ac acquiring a customer, um, but the average contract value of that customer, the average retention, right? And what you'll see is no company that I've seen, at least, is great on all of these. And a lot of these, there's a strategic choice, right? Do you try closing really big deals with large, long sales cycles or a lot of smaller deals? And we want to see a, a, compl you know, a complementary and, and really a consistent and well thought out strategy that is clear to us that the company knows, hey, on these three elements, I want to be very strong. On these two elements, I'm okay to not be as strong because of the different game I'm playing in my industry. Um, we actually have this within, within our fund. We have, uh, we, you know, we've uh, characterized these as different animals, right? So we have one that's called a tiger, one that's called a rhino, one that's called a gazelle. Interesting. Okay. <laughs> really different <laughs> games, right? And, uh, and once we meet a company, we'll say, so we're all on the same page. Hey, this is a rhino, right? This is the game they're trying to play. And then we kind of assess them in a different way. That, that's on the later stage. On the earlier stage, um, we'll, we'll have to meet a lot more companies than on the later stage because a lot of those metrics, they're not there yet, right? Yeah, they do, do not exist. So how do you judge them? Besides it, the team that you already explained. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah, exactly. So, so I think there, um, there are specific markets that we're more interested in. Um, Elaborate. And so, so I mean, there's, there, there's really a, there, there's a long list, right? We're really interested in, in, um, and, 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 you know, those change, those change. There's, there's specific elements within cybersecurity, um, you know, cloud security we're really interested in. Uh, we really like anything that has to do with revenue operations, sales operations, basically the, the new way of managing a company's leads and growing them and nurturing them and scaling them. Uh, we, we really like um, anything that enables uh, remote work or remote collaboration. We really like anything that's codeless and can replace developers. Uh, we really like developer tools um, and tools that are aimed at helping build uh, and uh, sustain and maintain products or code in a different way. Right? So there, there's a list of, of stuff that we like. Right? And uh, my, my colleague is, uh, is you know, She'll look at most companies that are in that list within Israel, right? Um, and then it becomes, you know, the team is a very big part of that. And that specific strategy and competitive advantage within that space also becomes really core. Um, so it's, it's a little bit different because you're, you're not really going to see too much metrics. And if there's traction at that stage, that's also great. I mean, so... Think of the following. Think of a team that's solving a really interesting problem in a unique way with a sustainable technolo technological advantage. Plus, they've already engaged with a couple of large players and they're an initial proof of concepts, right? So that, there's no, no real revenue yet, but that to us is something that we, you know, we'd love to see because it shows two things. It shows, one, that some of the big players are taking note. And I think more importantly, it shows that these guys are, um, you know, guys or girls, they're, you know, tough enough and creative enough to go very early and say, hey, I'm going to reach for the moon. I'm going to go to the big guys and I'm going to start working with them, you know, ASAP. And that's that's the type of, you know, culture and mindset that we love. When you see a lot of startups, what are the soft spots and what can, kind of tips you can give them? Because you see it all mm -hmm. the time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so I think it's, uh, it's, there, there, there's, a, there's a bunch of, um, of, of kind of tips on, on how you think through and how you present your idea to what is someone, I mean, think about the situation that we're in. We're meeting, you know, we're seeing a lot of great companies. We're really, really busy. We're, we're really trying to understand, right? So the, 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 the simpler you make it for us to understand what you're doing and why you think you're unique doing it, the better, right? So, I'll, you know, I'll just give you a few, you know, tips that I think would be helpful for an entrepreneur. Um, one is a, a lot of folks, they, they'll spend a lot of time characterizing the problem, right? This is the problem. This is the problem. This is the problem. Um, and then sometime characterizing why they have a cool solution, 
right? And then again, not enough spent on the how, on how they intend to build a great company and what is their strategy. And the roadmap and milestones. A, 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 exactly, right? And, and uh, so I'd, I'd focus on that because on our side, we'll, we will likely, you know, somewhat understand the problem because we, you know, we see a lot of these companies or we'll get it relatively quickly. So, so you say, what's, what's your plan? Exactly, right? What's your plan? And, and even one step further, why is that plan achievable? Gotcha. Right? Yeah. And even if you, you, know, you may have a little bit of traction, you may not, but I'd say focus more on that. And, and, and then there's, there's, there's elements that I think are, um, you know, if you can send your materials or your deck in advance of the meeting. And, you know, what, what we'll usually do is we'll review them, we'll come with questions, and it becomes a higher level discussion yeah. than it is if we're just trying to figure it out, right? And um, if, if you, if you, um, you know, be, be honest with us and tell us, you know, one question that I all, you know, maybe two questions I always ask an entrepreneur is, what are you looking for in an investor? You know, let's say two investors both give you the same amount of capital. What's important for you? So I think that that is something that it's important for them to think about in advance. And then I also think, you know, I also ask them, if you look at your company right now, what do you think you have figured out? And if you had more capital, you can scale it. It could be technology. It could be marketing. It could be anything. And what are you, what are you still not figured out? And what do you still need help thinking about? And, and be honest still, about it. Right, and be honest gonna, about it, you know, because... Come clear. Right, and, and the, the, the right answer for that is never, you know, hey, I have everything figured out, yeah, right? Of it's, course. It's, uh, <laughs> that's ra- it's very rare when that's the case. <laughs> All right, you, you touched about materials. What are your favorites? Um, I mean, what do you like to get? What helps you the most? A one-pager plus a deck plus a business plan? Today, oh. it's a video pitch. Yeah. Oh. Yeah, uh, our conference. I, I don't know. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I don't know. So maybe this is because of my, my consulting background. Um, I, I like to see a deck. Um, and the deck um, has to basically include all the elements that we care about. It, it needs to include uh, the, 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 the market, how big the market is, the problem, uh, the, the specific technological advantage uh, that the company thinks it has, the competitive landscape. You know, the team, of course, and the go-to-market, right? What we just talked about. Um, so I, I like to see that. To me, that's not too much if, if that's sent in advance. But I think some others, this is really a personal style. Um, the way I would do it is I'd have one deck that is like a fuller deck, and it doesn't need to, cre- to, 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 to contain very confidential information, but, but also, you know, your investor is likely not going to replicate your company and start it on its own right so i wouldn't be too cautious of that at that time so that's one and then i'd also have a one pager and once there's an introduction between sometimes you know another from another fund or from whoever is introducing you to this fund i'd ask hey would it be helpful for you to, to to see you know our deck or our one pager or other materials in advance of the conversation and then you know sometimes they'll say yes sometimes they'll say no and then you know you can you can say you have both versions connecting to your answer about you know sharing it before we we worked with a lot of entrepreneurs and startups and you know some of them are really up to share it all you know share the idea give yeah. the entire material some of them are really you know defensive NDAs yeah. Um, you know, secretive about yeah. about their idea. Um, uh, try to try to help them with that. You know, What's yeah. The balance. Yeah. So, I mean, I, I have a pretty strong perspective on that. I would say um, first, the, the 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 only thing, like it's not the the main thing you should really be concerned about is if that investor. Um, maybe they didn't realize it before talking to you, but they're already invested in a company that's competitive to you. Um, so that you need to check. You know, it's very easy to check who's invested in, in who. You know, there's Crunchbase or whatever, yeah. right? So take a look. Assuming that is not the case, um, I would I, I would share almost everything, right? I would share almost everything um, because you know almost everything that you're allowed to share right if you have a client that that doesn't want to be named for now of course i would not share that yeah right but almost but that's anything... more matters of privacy i mean in matters of your idea pitch deck 
whatever you do technology wise just show whatever you can show so you could have a deeper look at it yeah, right yeah yeah i mean the, the so you know you don't need to share your code yeah right yeah. no but but the investor can't make a decision without knowing um you know at, to, to detail what your plan is what traction you have and what your you know what your technology really is so without that you're almost you can't really have the conversation you said not sending a code but at the end of the day i want to go a step further into due diligence what yeah. what do should they expect how is that you know process going on at the end of the day you do want to check that this thing actually you know works yeah yeah so i think by, by that by that point so there's um you know due diligence is different funds do it in different ways um to us we call whatever we do before deciding to invest we call it research and then after giving a term sheet we'll call that due diligence and to us you know if we've given a term sheet um very 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 high probability we'll go on and make the investment to us we're, we're really just checking that the factual accuracy of what was told to us we're not really doing a lot more research after we've given a term sheet um but but in that phase You know, it's obviously both sides have become very serious about each other. You know, you can have you can sign an NDA, right? You can be protected by by anything that 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 stage. That's full disclosure, right? Including the code and the research process. How long for and what do you what do you check? Yeah. So so it it it, it really ranges um, if it's a space that we know well. Um, it could be as little as a few weeks. And if it's a space that we don't know well, it could be as long as, you know, three or four months, right? Um, so there, there really isn't that um, specific time frame. I think what we'll check is first we'll go very deep into the company. Um, you know, we'll look at all the financials. We'll look at all the revenue. We'll look at the pipeline. We'll try to project the future revenue on our own. Um, that's, we'll do a bunch of stuff that, with the company on our own right then we'll try thinking about what external perspectives do we need that will be helpful for us in making a decision and um, most times there will be a technical perspective so we'll usually bring an expert from the outside um, to assess the the technology and we'll sometimes bring an industry expert to talk about the need and the market and the model right and sometimes they'll talk to us sometimes they'll talk directly with the company So we'll do that. And then a very big part of, of the research is, is, is chatting to the company's clients. Um, what so can we'll help, also do that. What can help that process um, become even shorter or um, with, a, with a higher percentage rate of success? Let's say, you know, a lot of people say you come with a backup of the, um, from the uh, Innovation Authority of mm-hmm. Israel. So mm-hmm. that, that helps some, some of the research process. process or yeah. due diligence yeah I mean it's, it's a it's a great question I think this is something that our industry hasn't figured out because one of the things is is you know you can also also think about it a different way um, sometimes there's a funding round and then six months after that there's another funding round well actually there could be a great fund right before you that research a lot of the same things right you're doing it again but I think in essence you um, Sometimes we'll talk to each other, but, but I think um, each fund will usually, lead, especially each lead investor in each round, will want to do their own primary research. So it's very difficult to, um, you know, to, 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 to shorten the process. What the company can do is they can set up, they can anticipate the questions we'll ask and have the answers ready, right? So let's say they have three core clients. Yeah. Um, They can chat with them in advance hey you know I have an investor that's very close to investing would you be willing to have a half hour conversation with them answer some of their questions right and then anticipate that I will want an introduction and then you probably remove a week in the process you know stuff like that what mistakes entrepreneurs do during the process with you that you see that it, 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 it's a common mistake mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so I think one um, one mistake um, Is, uh, is, is, is trying to, 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 you know, I'll call it trying to conquer the world and, and not focusing. Um, if, if you think about what it, what it takes to scale a business, let's say you have a 
you've developed a product that's based on, on you know, what, what is hopefully really advanced technology. There's a need in the market. You have a little bit of, of, of uh, revenue coming in. You have a few, a few clients. And now you're looking to really grow it, right? You want to go 5x, 10x, 100x. That's incredibly difficult, right? It's very, very hard. It's not by chance that the vast majority of companies, even with great technology, fail, mm -hmm. right? And in order to be able to do that, you need to learn to do one, two, three things really, really well and how you bring opportunities in, how you engage with them, what, what is your pitch to them, how you, pro, you know, all of that. And what I sometimes see companies do is they, they'll say, hey, we'll do one and we'll do two and we'll do three and we'll have a small team doing this. Well, it's very, very hard to get all of those things right. So they're much better off focusing on one or two, you know, call it avenues of growth what the product looks like, what the pitch looks like, what the offering looks like, what the customer looks like, how they engage with them, and try to get, you know, try to do that really, really, really well versus, you know, trying to do everything under the sun. Um, you said before that it's okay to have, like, multiple business models or, or you know, do many things, but then just to try to, to accurate what you just said, um, be conscious about where you good at or mm -hmm. what is your main channels than than channels that you know and and very conscious about that you're weak yeah 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 and and and, and i would say so there, there, there's um right so every company they need to have a marketing function they need to have a sales function and you know within sales right there's different ways to do sales within marketing different ways to do marketing right within product there's different elements of the product the back end the front end right um, and all of those we should think about as skills, right? If we were a car, if we were each different cars, right? One car has a lot of horsepower and one car is really comfortable on the inside, they, they can both sell a lot, right? But the, 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 the company needs to think where they need to be really, really strong and where they need to be just okay, right? So I think that's kind of thought one. And then in terms of, of figuring that out and optimizing that, well, what does that resonate? Like, what road do you want to drive on, right? So the Ferrari may want to drive on one road and call that a channel, call that maybe the Ferrari only wants to sell to, you know, big banks in the U.S. in a direct way mm -hmm. versus the, the Jeep wants to sell to, to you know, mid-size uh, banks globally, and they'll do it mostly via channels, right? So those are two totally different models and one may one may be right for one company and another may be right for another company right so i think doing both of those is really hard in the beginning of our episode you said that you're becoming a partner so do you find yourself reflected to companies and guide them and actually show them the the right way if they are not focused as you said yeah. So, so, so first of all, um, I wouldn't say we show them the right way because we, we, we often don't know what the right way is. Right. And it's, and it's, uh, I think it's, it's silly to assume that, um, we will come into the company and, and we'll know, you know, what to do right better than the company. What, what we do know is sometimes we, we've encountered this issue a bunch of times in different companies. So we can bring that perspective and, and sometimes we could just be a partner to help the, the founding team, you know, the management, think about, think about that problem, right? Should pricing be A, B, or C? Should we focus on channel X or channel Y? Like, how do we make that decision, right? So we, we'll think through that together and we'll work on that together. And it's, it's more about being a partner in the thought process throughout this journey and, and on helping wherever we can than on us necessarily telling them the answers. Tell us about, uh, I know that you have a few success stories of exits, but tell us about them, but also tell us about companies that you invested in and you know that something down the road went wrong. Yeah, um, I mean, so, be, so, so first, be, because we, we have a little bit of a, uh, a different model, be, because we're, we're um, you know, we, we have some regulations that, that prohibit us uh, to speak on specific portfolio companies publicly because we're also a, a public market investor, okay. right? So um, we, have, we have some issues around that. Um, so we, I can't discuss any specific portfolio companies. You know, we, we, we did have, um, you know, we're fortunate to, to, to have had uh, a good amount of successes. We've had uh, now eight exits. 
Um, some were, you know, more famous, you know, in, in uh, quotation, some were less. I mean, one, one of our big success stories was a, what was a company called Dome 9 that was acquired by Checkpoint, um, right? And there are, you know, there, there, there are others. Um, the, the, what I can say more generally is that um, obviously you hope that each company will become a great, you know, a great success story and come with an exit and uh, or, you know, uh, go to the public markets. And we are very optimistic that, um, that th th that's going to happen for a lot of our companies. It's um, for, for the entrepreneurs listening, right? It's, it's, a, it's a really long road from starting a company to get there. Sometimes you may be surprised it can happen after a couple of years. Um, but, you know, you, you really need to be in it for the long term and think about how do you build a big company um, versus, you know, a lot of folks will, will think about, hey, how, how do I make the, you know, you don't control your exit usually, right? It, it, it'll, it'll sometimes come from the outside. So. Yeah. So it's a marathon. It's not a sprint. A exactly. Although it's, uh, it's a marathon of sprints <laughs> when it comes to... to it's stuff. a marathon that you're sprinting the whole way. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So you come from, uh, you have a background. You're an associate partner at McKinsey. And you were involved in, in alliances and acquisitions over there. But that's, you know, uh, the, big, the big players, the heavy-duty yeah. companies of, uh, of enterprise uh, market. Um, what does that give you, like a special angle when you come today and you invest in startups and early stages? Mm -hmm. and how, what did you uh, bring from there into your new perspectives yeah so, so i think first of all uh, you know I, I spent a good amount of time uh working with companies in different industries um in in just a, a regular advisory capacity this was mostly in the u.s i did a lot of work with banks i did a lot of work with uh, telecom companies with cpg so i think it's um one of the cool things there is i got a chance to 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 learn about a bunch of different challenges in a bunch of different industries so um you know, I've, I've seen a bunch of stuff. So that, I think that's helpful in understanding what, what predominantly an American enterprise thinks about when trying to solve companies, uh, when trying to solve uh, specific challenges. So I think that's one. In, in, my, in my previous role, uh, which was, was um, you know, McKinsey's cor corporate, corporate development and partnership and investment arm in one body, what we were trying to do there is we were trying to think about, you know, you know how our industry is going to look like in the future. Um, how does McKinsey advise specific clients within those industries, and how will, how is that offering getting disrupted? And then, as a as a, the, pro the next stage in the process, how can we bring usually a an advanced player, a, you know, that 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 has a uh, a really distinctive piece of software or data or other platforms and combine it with the advisory work um, that 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 McKinsey was doing. Um, you know, at the time. So that's what I was doing, right? So I, I would, uh, did that in the U.S., did that in Israel, and, and did that in, in, in Asia, and, um, you know, got a chance to engage with, with hundreds of startups. Um, and when, when we did find something that we thought were, was interesting, we'd sometimes uh, acquire them, we'd sometimes partner with them, uh, we'd sometimes invest in them. And, uh, but I think the most important part was uh, we, we'd work together to, to build a new offering that was tech enabled, uh, and I've learned a lot of that. You know, uh, you know, I've learned a lot um, about how do you take the DNA of a startup and how do you take the the DNA of a large company, and it could be by partnering, it could be by um, you know selling, and how do you mesh those two together to create something that that works, right? And after making a lot of mistakes and seeing a lot of mistakes, I think you. You know, the, some of that pattern, pattern recognition is helpful for me right now. So it's with you on your mechanism research and how you look at things. Yeah. And, and it's also, a, you know, it's also a lot about the mindset, right? I'll, I'll give you one thing that, that I think is a great, you know, thinking point for entrepreneurs. Um, a lot of times it's intimidating. You know, I'm a small company. I'm, you know, 10 people in a small office or working from home, and now I'm talking to this big, you know, big client, you know, uh, big name that I know of, and I'm excited and I'm nervous and all of that. And, um, and you know, I, I get that. But, but if, you, if, if you think small 
And if you think that you're a small player, you will be a small player and they won't want to work with you, right? So it, it, it's, it's about um, trying to get to a point, first of all, in your mindset that, hey, you know, I believe in myself that I've developed something that is unique enough and is important enough for them to even want to engage with me, right? They're engaging with me and do that in a way that you're on equal footing, right? I don't come to them and beg for their business, right? You're partnering with them to do something together. They're not better than you. You're not better from, than them. You're different. They're a big company. You're a small company now. Mm -hmm. But um, the more startups think of themselves as, as um, you know, companies that can engage with these larger enterprises from the beginning on equal footing, um, I think the better. And a lot of it is a mindset. Let me take us to another direction. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the equity pie. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> uh, every entrepreneur is in the beginning, okay, we are all partners, we're all equal, and then you start uh, taking an investment and it's influence, it's a new player in the equity pie. Mm -hmm. What kind of advice can you tell uh, entrepreneurs in how much to give, how you evaluate, how to... Yeah. address it how to split the pie yeah, yeah. how to split the pie. yeah i mean so yeah. it, it's a it's, it's a really really important um you know it's a really important point because a lot of companies were unable to scale just because they made these mistakes very early on and there was either not enough equity to then go around to be attractive to other investors or just you know what's called the cap table which is basically the list of who owns this company um was so out of order that that made it a um, very difficult for them to raise more capital after. Here, I mean, here's what I'll say. First of all, think about um, who you want to own this company with you. Um, you need to do research on anyone that's investing in your company. Is this someone, this, this will be a part of your company. Is this someone that you want as a partner? Is this someone that you want in your board meetings? You know, are they going to be there for you when times are tough, right? So first of all, think about the who, right? Once you've made the decision on the who, you, you think about the how much, right? The general rule is you try to figure out um, what is your, you know, what's called your burn rate, how much money are you burning on a monthly and quarterly basis? And in large companies, there's a gross, which is your, you know, your operating expense, the sum of all of your operating expenses. And there's a net, which is that number, net of any cash flow that your revenue is creating, right? In, in earlier companies, it's mostly that gross. And what you need to do is you need to do the math of you know, you, you usually raise somewhere, you know, that's a lot of that is changing now, but you usually raise every 18 months. So you'll, you know, plan that for the next 18 months. You'll add a buffer. You know, sometimes that'll be 20% or whatever that is. And then that's roughly the amount that you're going to raise, right? That, that's roughly the amount. Then comes the question of, um, you know, how much is your company worth? And th there really is, there's no hard or fast rule in early stage on how much your company is worth, right? It's, you know, so, you know in, in some, some companies, they'll raise their initial round at a valuation of, you know, $6 million. Some will be at $40 million, right? Very hard to know. A lot of it is determined by the space, by the, how advanced the tech is, how big the market is. Is this an entrepreneur that, you know, has, has shown a lot of success in the past? So they could command higher prices. Um, but what I'd say is you really um, do, you, you, you want to give, obviously, as little of your company away as possible. And it's uh, on any individual round, you're probably not going, want, you're not going to want to eclipse around a third of dilution, you know. Um, and those are again; those are these are rules. You know, rules are meant to be broken. Um, but but I I I think I think of that. Um, and you also don't want any individual investor um, to to own too big of a too big of a stake in the company, right? And too big of a stake is different in different markets. But um, you know, obviously not majority. If you're an early stage investor and you want you want to you know retain control, um, but 
you know, above 35, 40%, that, that also starts being, uh, being problematic in a lot of situations. So how do you deal with uh, the new trend of crowdfunding? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, so it's... Good question. Uh, uh, yeah, I mean, it, 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 it is a good tr- uh, question. It's, it's interesting. I think there's, there's a pro and there's a con to, to, to this space. The pro is, hey, everyone reads about startups. A lot of people see these exits. A lot of people want to participate. <clears throat> and, you know, hey, how can the, the regular person invest in the success of these, these, these great future companies? Um, to me, I, I have to say that the, 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 the model of, um, call it a retail investor, investing in an early stage startup is a little bit scary to me. Uh, because we, you know, First of all, we're, we're professionals. We do this on a daily basis. Um, that's one. And then two, we'll, we'll spend a ton, we'll do a ton of research on companies and we'll, uh, we'll really agonize through it. Um, and we won't invest in most of them. I think the, the average retail investor, when they're making a direct investment in a startup, um, they need to trust that they need to either do that level of investing uh, uh, that level of research on their own which some can but but many can't either because you know they don't have the time or expertise or access to information um, and if they don't do that they need to trust that whoever is offering them that opportunity is an, is a body or institution that has done the most rigorous investment on on what is essentially a very dangerous asset class and Um, and, and most startups don't do well, right? So um, I, I would say it it's, it's, uh, has a lot of opportunity, but I also don't love the opportunity to, to, to give the average retail investor an opportunity to just invest in 50 different startups because I think that that will create a bad uh, experience for them. But in matters of, of your deal flow or, uh, or search, when it comes to an angel investor, yeah. uh, you can call him, you know, mm-hmm. and you can check his portfolio and see his uh, success investments before um, success, success rate, I mean. Right. Um, when it comes to crowdfunding, how do you address, how do you look at that? How do you look at that new factor, you know? Yeah, um, I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a great question. I mean, that's, that's exactly why I think it's, it's, a, it's a problem if it's not governed really well. Um, so yeah, I think it's, you know, going back to one of our original points is um, the, the, the main predictors of success are, are not if it's a great idea and not even if it's a great idea in a, in a great market, but it's, it's, the, it's the execution. Um, and, and with that, you know, you may be a retail investor and say, hey, this is a great, th- th- this sounds great. This is something I've always imagined. And maybe it is a great idea. Like I believe in the vision. Exactly. I believe in the vision, but, but that's actually not what is most correlated to success. It's the execution yeah. um, of that vision. So I think it, it just, it requires a lot of research. All right. We're going to wrap it up. But before we do that, um, We want you to try and pull out major three tips that you can you know give to entrepreneurs that are listening right now. Um, your major three tips. Mm-hmm. Great. Um, so first, I'd say, you know, think big, right? Um, especially if you want to raise capital because we're we're not interested in small ideas. Um, and I think your time is not. Uh, if you want to create a, a big company, um, your time is not well spent on a small idea, on a small market, on all of that. So I, I'd say first, think big, think big in your vision, and think big in, in um, you know, the types of companies that you choose to engage with. So, so I'd say one. Um, two, and you know, I've been harping on this again and again, is think about your strategy on how you... You know how you'll get revenue into this company in a sustainable way and as early as possible think about how you execute on that strategy the how the how right yeah. that is just that is the most critical part um, of your business and don't be afraid you know try and try don't be afraid to try things saying hey that that didn't work let me get feedback let me try something different spend time figuring out your competitive advantage on the go-to-market right so That's the second thing. And then third thing, um, really, really think about the people, 
right? And and because everyone you engage with, everyone you choose to partner with, it could be the other people you hire into your company. It certainly is your co-founders, and it definitely is your investors that will be you know part of this company as as um, board members and partners. If those are folks that are not a good fit for you, either from a personal standpoint or a professional standpoint, your company's not going to work out, right? So I'd say, you know, that's maybe the most important piece. Really, really think about, you know, who you're going to spend time with to build this business and who you're going to spend time personally with over the next, mm-hmm. you know, five, six, seven to 15 years uh, in this, building this business. Thanks so much, Gal. Yeah. And I really relate to that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you to you. It was, it was uh, very a lot of fun. Thank you. And to all our audience out there, this was another episode of Till VDNA. And you can listen to it on all major platforms, Spotify, Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and watch it on YouTube. So thanks again, Gal. And Ilan. <laughs> Thank you, Juan. Thank you for having me. <laughs> all right. See you next time, folks. <laughs>